season. And Advent, the idea of Advent, is preparing ourselves for the arrival of the Messiah. Um, and, and as we look at that, uh, one of the things I want to examine today is, is the idea that this coming of the Messiah is truly an amazing thing. And, and we should be humbled that, that God would pour out His favor upon us. And, and the question comes, I mean, we, we are blessed abundantly and amazingly by God. Why would He do this for us? I mean, did we deserve it? No. So why would God do this for us? And, 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 and knowing that He has done this for us, how, how should we respond to it? And in today's passage, we're going to once again look at uh, Mary and Elizabeth, and we're going to discover through their example, God's favor is poured out onto us for His glory and for the sake of others. So if you have a Bible and you'd like to follow along, we're going to be in Luke 1, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke's the third book of the New Testament. Luke 1, 39, and I'm going to read 39 through 56. Uh, Luke 1, 39 through 56. There are Bibles in some of the chairs, and uh, if you've got an iPhone or iPad or Android or whatever, feel free to look it up on that if you've got a Bible app. And this is the recounting of Mary when she goes and visits Elizabeth. And the backstory, of course, is that the angel of the Lord had appeared to Elizabeth and to her husband and said, you guys are going to get pregnant and you're going to have this child. His name's going to be John. And uh, uh, through that, he's going to be the forerunner for Jesus. And then the very same angel, the angel Gabriel, goes to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and tells her, uh, you are also going to have this miraculous birth. And so that's the kind of where we're at in this stage. And so the birth of Jesus has been foretold. The birth of John has been foretold. Now Mary has gone and she's going to visit uh, her, her cousin Elizabeth. And there it says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary... The baby leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Verse, 20, verse 46, And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he looked on the humble of states of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her, with Elizabeth, about three months, and then returned to her home. So as we hear this, it's crucial for us to understand what it means when we talk about the favor of God. And this is important because uh, it's an idea that we hear thrown around from time to time, especially, unfortunately, by some pastors. Um, how, how often have you heard from some well-meaning Christian or maybe even a well-meaning pastor, or they use this term of, uh, of being in God's favor, and, and, and they use it in relationship to some sort of good break in life, right? Like, like I, got, I got upgraded to first class flight. God's favor, right? Or, or I got free tickets to the big game. That was God's favor. Or, or hey, I got, I, got, I got a sweet discount on my new car. God's favor, right? Um, it's common for us to label these sorts of things as God's favor. And I'm certainly not saying that we shouldn't be grateful for those blessings. We should. But that is not actually what it means to speak of God's favor. 
And as we look at this biblical idea of, of what God's favor is, we can't escape the fact that it is actually oftentimes attached to this theme. That God's favor is attached to the idea that God is trusting us to actually bear a difficult mission. You see, God's favor is God's grace poured out on us for the sake of others. And generally speaking, when he does that, it comes with sizable responsibilities and expectations. God's favor is the guarantee, though, of his presence and of the provision for his purpose. But that doesn't mean your life will all of a sudden get easier because of it. In fact, it almost certainly means, as God pours his favor out on you, that your life is probably going to get harder, in fact. Let me give you a couple of examples if you doubt me. Think of Noah. Noah found God's favor, right? Anybody think his job got easier when he found God's favor? He had to build an ark. He had to preserve the human race. He had to endure everybody thinking he had lost his mind, right? God's favor caused him to be a social outcast. How about Joseph? Joseph found God's favor, right? He had difficulty everywhere he went. Yet he found favor with God in every season of his life. How about Jesus? I don't think anybody would argue that God's favor was upon Jesus, right? Definitely had God's favor. Well, that wasn't an easy road to walk, I could tell you that. It led to his death. And the common denominator in all of these examples is that none of what they accomplished would have been possible without the favor of God. But, you see, their lives weren't any easier because of God's favor. Now looking at our passage here, why did God pour out His favor upon Elizabeth and Mary of all people, right? And, and, and as you read through this story, if you go back and read it after church today, or you're reading it as a family or something, you will see the word favor is used, or, or blessed, or you know, a variant of it, depending on your translation. But favor is used about each woman. If you look at, look at Elizabeth's response in, in verse 41 through 45, you'll see this, where it talks about her favor. Her mind was blown by the honor that she was given to be there and to be able to see her Lord's mother coming. Why would you come to me, she says. And then you look at Mary. Look at the theme of Mary's song. It's, it's you know, the magnificent, uh, magnific, magnificat. I can't say that word. Is, is the term sometimes that's used for the song that Mary wrote. And actually parallels very nicely, if you remember Hannah's song from the Old Testament. And, and, and this comes in verses 46 through 55. And, in, and as you hear Mary's voice as she's singing and as she's writing this, she's, she's, she's overwhelmed, she's, she's humbled by this opportunity. And so what attributes set these women up for this gift? What, what, what actions, what, what accomplishments put them in the path of this blessing of the Lord? Well, if you read it, none, right? Nothing as far as we can tell that they did apart from these two women were humble in their surrender to the Lord. And they had a very simple faith. And so what is the purpose of this favor then? Is this favor on Mary and Elizabeth so that it might elevate their status among the women of their society? No. What was, was this favor given to them as, as a, uh, a chance to get a leg up in social society or, or makes, you know, maybe they can get famous off of it and uh, get their own TV show? Well, that wouldn't work back then, but, or whatever, right? No, that wasn't the purpose. The purpose of receiving this favor of the Lord was to be a blessing for the world. That indeed these women would deliver our deliverance in the form of a forerunner and then the Messiah. This favor is to prepare the way of the arrival of our redemption. This favor is God's grace poured out on them for the sake of others. 
As you read through Luke, Luke is really a neat, neat book. You'll see that Mary and Elizabeth are wonderful heroines in Luke's account of Scripture. In Luke's writing, in fact, he frequently focuses on the women and their amazing contributions to the story. And in particular, it seems he really loves these two women. And the thing that that, that seems to impress him the very most, it it would appear as I read through it anyhow, is is the thing that he wants to impress upon his reader Theophilus is is that these women didn't think much of themselves. They, They considered themselves to be lowly. They had humility, despite God's amazing blessing in their lives. They didn't think that made them great in and of themselves. Elizabeth says it in verse 43, And and why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord would come to me? And Mary says it in verse 48, She says, the Lord has regarded the the low estate of his servant or of his handmaiden, your Bible might say. Handmaiden, right? I love that term. Handmaiden. The the one whose sole purpose and function is to serve someone else. The, The only people in the story whose soul magnify the Lord are the people like Elizabeth and Mary. People who acknowledge their state, that they are just lowly people. And then in that, they are overwhelmed by the reality that our magnificent God would lower Himself down to us to come and be at our level. Mary doesn't in any way view herself as as better or, or holier than anyone else. She views herself as as a simple young woman, as a, as a sinner who is in need of God's salvation. She sees herself as the Lord's servant, whose, whose humble estate is the occasion for His mercy and grace, actually. And there's no hint anywhere in Scripture that, that she thinks that, that God has chosen her to be the mother of the Messiah because of her specialness. But rather, she sees it as her blessedness is the result of God's sovereign and gracious choice to use her as his vessel and instrument. She makes it very clear in verse 48 that her blessedness is all the result of God's grace. Then if you're following along in verse 50, you see... As Mary is going through and she's listing how God has has blessed her and poured His grace upon her, she starts out with with a somewhat narrow focus of talking about herself, viewing God's grace as a a reflection of His graciousness for His purposes, for His chosen people, for her. And then she broadens out into how that affects and impacts the greater people of God. You see, God hadn't just singled out Mary for His blessing leaving all the others behind in its wake. Mary understood this, and and she saw this. And she saw her blessing as but an illustration of of a single instance of God's grace, which led her then to, to praise God, to praise Him for His grace, to share that those who fear Him and love Him can share in this blessedness. That it wasn't just her personal benefit that the blessing that she received was to be for all of mankind. So as we dig through these layers, and we're talking about God's favor, it raises the question of, yeah, I guess I can see why God might have blessed this person and that person in Scripture, but why me, right? Why, Why does God pour out His blessing on us. I mean, He has, hasn't He? Yeah. And why does God do that? And yes, we're just on the tail end of Thanksgiving, but when was the last time you really paused, really stopped, really considered the blessing God has poured out? The last time you took an account of God's blessing 
The last time, when was the last time you, you expressed to God your gratitude for the good gifts that He has given? And I would challenge you that Christmas is the perfect time to do this. It's a great time to look pa- back across this year and, and to see just how you've been blessed. In fact, maybe we should do it right now. Why don't we just take a second? Why don't we pause? And think for just a minute. How has God blessed you this year? There might have been challenges. There might have been difficulties. That comes with life. But in it, God has blessed us. Abundantly. God loves you, folks. He loves you as His child. He's not a distant God. He's not a foreign God. He's not a God that we can't know. He's a God who came Emmanuel in the flesh. So how has God blessed you this year? And why? Right? It's one thing to acknowledge, yeah, oh, God has blessed me. But why? Why you and me, of all people, right? I mean, I'm not perfect. I'm a sinner. I'm pretty sure you are too. Sorry if you didn't know that. Why does God pour His blessing on a, a bunch of messed up, jacked up, broken, screwed up people like you and me? Why have we received His favor his blessing. Once again, it's because God has poured out His grace on us for the sake of His glory and so that we might point others to Him. And so we must continually be looking for for ways that we can respond to give God all glory and then to give ourselves away for the sake of others, as God has done for us. Our praise during this Christmas season should especially be patterned after that of Mary. You see, if you read through this passage, and I would challenge you, read through it again after today. Notice, Mary doesn't ever really focus on this tiny little baby that she's going to hold in her arms, right? That's never the focus. She focuses on the God who sent the Messiah. And she focuses on the goal that he was going to accomplish by coming to earth. And in this Christmas season, I would challenge you that we too should see beyond the birth of the baby and look towards the end for which he came. Jesus came to this earth to restore and reconcile fallen men to a perfect God and to one another. That's why Jesus came. And the miracle of of the virgin birth, which is the basis and starting point in, in the praise of these two women, is a beautiful thing. And as we look at that, we, we can see in it a comparison that's comparable to the miracle of new birth. And new birth is something that every man, woman, and child must experience in order to have eternal life. And they need to have it in order to live the life in which the Lord has intended for us. As we read through these first two chapters in the book of Luke, and that's what we'll be working on next week as well still, we see a principle at work in these first two chapters that that can be found elsewhere in the Bible. And this principle is a simple one, but it can be stated in this way. It's that a miraculous person begins with a miraculous birth. A miraculous person begins with a miraculous birth. And as you read your Bible, you'll see what I'm talking about. Think about the Old Testament, right? In the Old Testament, there's some miraculous ministries of God, and He chose the instruments, the men and women, that He performed those miraculous ministries through. And and there was, in each one of those stories, a miraculous birth. Think of Abraham. Think of Samuel. 
Think of Samson. Miraculous. And so it's not at all surprising that when we get to the New Testament, we find a similar pattern. That both John and Jesus are miraculous. And both of their lives are miraculous. And while we can't say that every single miraculous life began with a miraculous birth, I think it is safe to say that every miraculous birth resulted in a miraculous life and ministry. God is clearly involved in it. And why does this matter? Well, it matters because there are people who seem to think that they can live according to the standards and principles of the Bible if they set their minds to it. They decide, I'm just going to work harder to be better. That's the simplified version. But that's not really the way things work. It's not actually possible. We can't actually accomplish that. At least, not on our own power. You see, the Bible requires that we live a life which is miraculous. But that's a life that we as humans, this side of the fall, can't accomplish. Read the book of Romans. Romans 7 tells us we can't live the perfect life, right? There's only one way that can happen. The only way the miraculous can come in, and that is for us then to have a new birth. Because we were born into a broken world filled with sin. This is exactly why when Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, he tells Nicodemus, you have to be born again. Even though Nicodemus, and if you know the story, Nicodemus was, was this prominent teacher in Israel. But no, It's not what you know. No, it's not what you've done. No. You've got to be born again, Nicodemus. And in my experience, there's a lot of nominal Christians in this world who are trying to live the impossible. Trying to fulfill the miraculous life, right? But they haven't experienced the miracle of being born again. Don't fall into this trap. You see, God doesn't grade on a curve, folks. You can't try harder. You can't just be a little bit better than this guy, or maybe not quite as bad as that lady, right? That isn't the criteria. Our salvation does not rest on any work that we can do. It rests solely on the finished work of Jesus on the cross. There are people, and... and I was once probably in this pool of people who thought that they would be a Christian by trying harder to live the good life. But you see, they need to begin to learn that becoming a Christian, that being born again, is illustrated here by Mary's child. While trying to be religious and do more works, is actually contrasted by the line of John. We are not saved by our works. The Bible is clear. Salvation does not result from our efforts. Our salvation comes about in the very same way that Mary's baby was conceived. Not any effort on her part, but miraculous. God does the work of producing life within us, just as He brought about life in Mary. We only need to believe and accept God's work on our behalf. But then we have to leave the working to Him and not to ourselves. Salvation is God's miraculous work in us, producing a new life. It's God finding favor in us. His blessing. His grace. So favor is far more than just a few good breaks in life. Favor is far more than a reward for simple right living. If that's all it was, that would be what karma is. And karma has no place in Christianity. 
Favor is God's grace towards us for the purpose of His glory and for the sake of others. And as you go out this week, if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, know that you have indeed found God's favor. But it doesn't mean your world will be any easier. It probably means it will be harder. But give thanks nonetheless. And then find ways to respond to that favor that blesses others for God's glory. If you haven't yet found that favor, if you haven't, for whatever reason, made that step of faith, if you haven't yet been born again, maybe that's why you're here today. Today could be the best day of your life. It could be the day where you learned that God really does love you. And He does. It doesn't matter what you've done. He loves you anyhow. And He simply wants you to love Him in return. That is what Christmas is about. Let's pray.